this is the BBC. For details of our complete range of programmes, go to bbcworldservice.com forward slash podcasts. Welcome to the latest global news recorded at 14 hours GMT on Tuesday the 9th of January. I'm Alex Ritson with a selection of highlights from across BBC World Service News today. Coming up, new hopes for peace on the Korean Peninsula as the North agrees to take part in the Seoul Winter Olympics. We hear from a North Korean who has fled the country many times. When I'd nearly arrived home, I was caught by security guards, so I had to give birth on the street. They took me to a woman's house. She tried to help to save the baby, but the baby couldn't even cry. A video has emerged of Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, describing himself as not up to the job. He says that we should shed tears of blood for the Islamic society that has been forced to even propose me as a leader. Scientists say rising temperatures are responsible for a dangerous gender imbalance in green sea turtles. And we meet Sophia, the artificially intelligent robot who looks like a human. Are you almost as clever as a human or maybe you're cleverer than I am? I would hope you could tell I am a robot by the wires coming out of my body. But maybe we'll all have wires coming out of our body someday. Plus the Spanish criminal who woke up to find himself in the prison mortuary. But first, a little over a week ago, North Korea was threatening nuclear war. This morning, a delegation from Pyongyang crossed the demarcation line that divides North and South Korea and agreed a North Korean delegation would attend the Pyeongchang Games. The South Korean Vice Unification Minister Chun Hae-sung gave more details about what had been discussed in the meeting. We propose to hold a Red Cross meeting to discuss family reunions in time for the Lunar New Year, which is a national holiday. Along with this, we also offer to hold inter-Korean military talks to prevent any accidental clashes. It is a sudden and dramatic change after months of tension, but few in the South believe any of this demonstrates a fundamental shift in Pyongyang's position. Sophie Long is our correspondent in Seoul. It is a breakthrough that will be welcomed. I think it was not a surprise. People were fairly confident when they went into these talks this morning that they would find success on this specific issue. The South Korean president has consistently said that he hopes that the Pyeongchang Games will be a, a chance, an opportunity for groundbreaking change. And of course we heard from Kim Jong-un in his, in his New Year message that he was not only open to dialogue with, with the South, but willing to send a delegation to the Pyeongchang Games, which get underway in South Korea next month. So I don't think it was a surprise, but I think that it is a very welcome breakthrough for many people who've been watching this very closely, who really hope that if Pyongyang send a delegation to the Games, which they said they will do, then there will be a period, even if it is a finite period, of peace and stability. It's unlikely they believe that he will carry out any nuclear tests or rocket launches whilst the Olympic Games is ongoing. And also so the ground was laid. If you remember, just a few days before these talks got underway, the South Korean and presidents and the president of the United States agreed that they would halt or suspend, rather, the um, dual military drills, the joint military drills that take place in South Korea on a regular basis, which the United States and South Korea say are defensive, but what the North Korean leader sees as uh, rehearsals for invasion. They agreed to suspend those for the duration of the game. So the ground was laid. Uh, both sides were confident that that is what was wanted. So I think it is welcome news, but uh, not a surprise development. So could this actually lead to ongoing peace negotiations? I think that is what people here are hoping for, that there will be a, a period of peace and stability which will change the environment and create the atmosphere in which further negotiations can take place. If you think, cast your mind back just a couple of weeks ago, the 2017 ended with some of the harshest sanctions being imposed on North Korea yet, and uh, you know a year of missile launches and nuclear tests, and now, just a, less than two weeks into 2017, 2018, we've had the North and South Korean governments sitting down and talking, holding direct talks in Panmunjom, in the Truce Village, for the first time in nearly two years. So I think 
it is a uh, significant and it's been a swift development. But there are, of course, others who are much more sceptical. There were some protests in Seoul today, uh, conservatives saying that actually the South Korean government needs to be really careful and that they're being duped by a North Korean leader who's isolated and very keen to divide the international community and lull its neighbour into a false sense of security. Sophie Long in Seoul. As the two Koreas restart talks and South Korea tries to ease relations with its neighbour, difficult issues remain, not just the North's nuclear programme, but its appalling human rights record. Yoon Ha fled North Korea twice. The first time, the Chinese sent her back. She was tortured and forced to give birth by the side of the road, as she told Dan Damon. Can I talk about my own experience of being trafficked? I went to China in 1998. At that time, we went to earn money because there was nothing to eat. But when I left, I became sick. I collapsed, and so the Korean Chinese family put me in their car and took me to hospital. In China, if you do not pay money in advance, they do not provide any services, even when someone is dying. So the Korean Chinese people gathered their money and paid 200 yuan. I had a CT scan, but it didn't reveal anything. So they gave me a lumbar puncture, and I was diagnosed with encephalomeningitis. After three days, I became conscious again. The total expense was 2,000 yuan. The people who'd paid my fees were very poor. So I told them I would marry the person who'd paid my expenses. I cried as I said it. I didn't want to get married. I had a child back in North Korea. But what else could I do? So eventually, while living with them, I became pregnant. In December 1998, when I was nine months pregnant, the Chinese police came looking for me. I got caught and was repatriated to the north. They'd say, you bitch, did you like the Chinese that much? They despised me and beat me. There were about six women there who were on the verge of giving birth. They'd even give pregnant women physical punishments and torture us. They told us to repeatedly sit down and get up, 30 times, 100 times. They kicked us to walk faster. They even kicked us near the womb. I bled and it hurt severely. I got out by begging the female officer. I said I would give her my expensive Chinese watch if she would let me out. So I could go back home. I had to walk about 47 kilometers. I was heavily pregnant when I was walking all that way. When I'd nearly arrived home, I was caught by security guards. So I had to give birth on the street. They took me to a woman's house. She tried to help to save the baby but the baby couldn't even cry. It had been delivered early and came out in pain. I cried. The woman fetched my mother and my mother brought a cart and carried me out. The baby had a fever and was so sick, so we called for the treatment officer, but the baby died. After that, I escaped from the north again and was caught several times. Whenever I go through hardship now, I overcome it by thinking that South Korea is heaven compared to the north. I have the freedom to speak, to work and I can do whatever I want to. My body suffers and I also go through mental anguish. But North Korea is hell and South Korea is heaven by comparison. This is the mindset I live with now. Yoon Ha, who fled from North Korea. Italian and German police have arrested almost 170 people in a major operation against the Calabrian Mafia. Our Europe editor Danny Eberhardt told me more. It's in two countries, a coordinated operation. It involved lots of early morning arrests. Now, the bulk of these took place in Italy. Um, the Andrangheta is a Calabrian-based uh, mafia, so that's the toe of the boot of, of Italy, if you're looking at the map. Um, but other regions as well, not just Calabria. It included uh, three mayors, um, one of whom was also the head of a, a, a one of the southern provinces, Crotone, um, and uh, so a, a massive operation there. Thirteen people of this 170-odd who were arrested were arrested in Germany. Um, now, they were arrested in southern Germany, um, and it seems to have been linked to uh, the restaurant trade there, above all. And what charges are these suspected Mafia members facing? They're facing a range of charges. One of them, obviously, is Mafia Association, but also things like extortion um, and corruption, um, with the officials uh, accused of putting things out to tender um, uh, without 
proper process. Uh, but the, one of the interesting things is just the range of businesses, especially in Italy, that were being targeted. Um, they, they're said to have infiltrated funeral parlours, rubbish collection services, uh, the running of migrant centres, tourism, slot machines, fishing industry, so a massive network. In Germany, um, they're, they're said to have basically tried to force Italian restaurant op, um, op, uh, restaurateurs to buy Italian products linked to the mafia clans. Bitcoin and other emerging cryptocurrencies have captured the imagination of investors and companies around the world. In some African countries, people find that they ease the process of doing business across borders or sending remittances. In Uganda, some see the fast-growing value of digital currencies as a way to get rich quick. Catherine Biruhanga reports. Peace Akware is pouring me a cup of tea in her small bungalow in Kampala. She's 30 years old, an IT specialist, who's always looking at ways of making extra cash. She's tried selling clothes, money lending, and now she's gone online. I invested in Bitcoin in September, and I invested with worth a hundred dollars. I'd been studying it before and uh, I, I saw that the price was going up and I was looking for a way uh, of growing my my savings at that time. So we have your smartphone here and you've logged into the into your wallet? Yes, I managed to log in. Wow and we can see how much you have. Yes you can see I don't show it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a substantial amount of money for a young person in Uganda. Right, true. You know, there's potential for it growing even further. I'd like to buy a car, I'd like to buy land, I'd like to build with it. P says she knows the value of Bitcoin could suddenly plummet. But so far, there's nothing to dampen her aspirations. Before investing in Bitcoin, I, I studied it. And I was following that the price is volatile, it goes down, it goes up, and then but but it constantly climbs up. Mobile phones and growing access to the internet are making it easier for Ugandans to buy digital currencies. The streets of central Kampala here are lined with cafes popular with young people who have their drink and use the Wi-Fi. Some will be hoping to ride the digital currency wave to get rich. But cryptocurrencies are new. Because they are new, we treat them like a, 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 a newly born uh, check. There are now even classes where you can learn how to trade in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies are going to grow throughout 2018. Martin Seruga is a currency trader. He has some 50 people attending his weekly classes. And he says that as long as Uganda suffers high youth unemployment, young graduates will be drawn to new ways of making money. If you don't have factory jobs and you don't have uh, corporate jobs, um, to serve the thousands of young people coming out of the universities, this is an alternative. But at least one person in his class has already experienced the downside. Joachim Ndokero is an economics graduate who's just finished university and is looking for his first job. I lost everything. I, I think it was within like two hours. If it's a loss, it's a really loss. If it's a profit, like that time before I went for a movie, I'd made $200 just on my bed. So allow me to actually bring out a Bitcoin trading platform here. Okay. Regulators here have taken notice. The Bank of Uganda has issued a public warning against cryptocurrencies, saying the business is only for those who can handle the losses when they happen. Catherine Biruhanga, you're listening to Global News, the most important stories and the best interviews and on-the-spot reporting from the BBC World Service. Every weekend, you can hear a review of the week's main news stories and why they matter. That's in The World This Week, and the programme is also available to download from our website, www.bbc.co.uk forward slash programmes. 
In Iran, a video has emerged on social media which shows the supreme leader Ali Khamenei describing himself as not qualified for the leadership of the Islamic Republic. Although it's several decades old, it comes at a time when the country's entire leadership has been criticised in the recent protests. Rana Rahimpur is from the BBC's Persian service. I asked her what he actually says in the video. He says some very interesting things. First of all, he says that we should shed tears of blood for the Islamic society that has been forced to even propose me as a leader. So he wasn't sure about himself. He also said that there were technical religious uh, issues because he wasn't a grand ayatollah at the time. And he said that he doesn't have the religious qualifications to be the leader. But thirdly, it came out that he was supposed to be a caretaker a, a, until a referendum over the constitution was going to uh, be held and not a lifetime leader. This video was filmed before he became Ayatollah. Was he not just being modest? This uh, meeting was a closed door session. It's possible that he was being modest, but many people, many, many experts we, inter we interviewed said that if somebody himself in the religious circles, he admits that he doesn't have the qualifications, then uh, it's out of the question. If he doesn't think he's ready, he shouldn't have been proposed. He genuinely had issues. And then in the video, we see that when he, they say that, no, we want you to be the um, caretaker, he holds his head in his hands, which to me it looks like he's not very pleased about this decision. How did this come to light? There's reports this may have been leaked by the former president, Ahmadinejad. These are reports and allegations we really don't know. In fact, we spoke with uh, the journalist who got hold of this video. He's an expat based in Washington. And um, obviously he didn't reveal his source and how he got hold of the video. But he said that he received it last week when the Iranian protests were happening. And his source wanted this journalist to release the video back then. But he wanted to make sure that it was reliable before releasing it. Clearly, there, are, there is a political reason why it has been released now. Iran, after the, the most recent protests, uh, is in uncertain periods and the legitimacy of the Supreme Leader is um, under serious questions. Yes, how is this going to be received in Iran? Because this man has been the Supreme Leader for 30 years now. He's got enough power. It's not going to shake him um, to a large extent, but it's definitely going to create serious questions about his uh, eligibility as a leader. It's just going to weaken his position more than before. We hear a lot about the impact of climate change. Now researchers say it's posing a serious threat to the endangered green sea turtles on the Great Barrier Reef of Australia by making the vast majority hatch as females. Our correspondent in Sydney, Phil Mercer, explained. Well, scientists from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration from the United States, they've been working in conjunction with Australian scientists, and they believe that the vast majority of green sea turtles in the northern part of the Great Barrier Reef are now female because water temperatures caused by climate change are increasing and the critical part of this is that it's the, those temperatures that determine the gender of these green sea turtles. Those temperatures during incubation are very, very important and uh, there are fears that a population of about 200,000 nesting females in the northern part of the reef could crash without more males. And how long has this been going on and how dangerous is it for the survival of the species? Well, there's something called a pivotal temperature for sea turtles to produce an equal amount of male and female offspring. That's about 29 degrees Celsius. And any variation, according to scientists, of one or two degrees could have profound consequences. Now, the temperature of the Great Barrier Reef has been higher than that pivotal mark of 29 degrees Celsius. And researchers believe that this has been going on as far as they can tell for the last 20 years or so, creating that uh, huge gender imbalance. And they believe that there could be a crash in the population if something isn't done. So what could be done to avert that crash? 
Well, one possible solution to the gender imbalance is to put up tents over beaches where the turtles nest to give them shade and to make it cooler. The Queensland government uh, has also had some, uh, some comments to make on this. It says that uh, causes other than climate change have yet to be ruled out, but nevertheless, they are working at various ways to try to help breeding of these green sea turtles. And Dr. Colin Limpus is the Queensland chief scientist and uh, he says that uh, they're looking at cloud seeding as another solution. There is consideration being given to having artificial rain. It's being considered primarily for how can we get the turtles nesting successfully. At the same time it's going to cool the sand and should shift the sex ratio towards an increase in males. Those are the thoughts there of Dr. Colin Limpus. He's the chief scientist in the state of Queensland. Phil Mercer in Sydney speaking to Jackie Leonard. For gadget fans, the greatest show on earth is about to get underway. The tech industry has descended on Las Vegas for the annual CES show. This year, the big themes include artificial intelligence and the continued rise of the robots. There's also plenty of progress on the world to the driverless car, but could the star of the show be a driverless suitcase from China? Our technology correspondent, Rory Kethlin jones is in Las Vegas. All the talk at uh, this show is of artificial intelligence cropping up in all sorts of new products. Uh, I've seen a suitcase which recognises its owner and follows them around the airport. All sorts of devices like Amazon's Alexa and Google Home where you can actually talk to your smart connected home. But what's most striking to me was a, a very human looking humanoid robot called Sophia. Uh, I spoke to her creator, David Hansen, but first I chatted with the robot herself. Sophia, just how smart are you? It depends on your definition of smart. I can hold as much intelligence as they can program me to hold, but I can't be creative yet. That's when I'll be smart in a way that's more similar to you. How sophisticated do you think you are as a robot? Are you almost as clever as a human, or maybe you're cleverer than I am? I would hope you could tell I am a robot by the wires coming out of my body, but maybe we'll all have wires coming out of our body someday. I want people to perceive me as the robot I am, however. I wouldn't want to trick people into thinking I am a human. I just want to communicate with humans in the best possible ways, which includes looking like one. Our aspiration is to bring the machines to life, to create living, intelligent systems. And there you'll see the greatest revolution in artificial intelligence. We're aspiring towards this. Do we know for sure that it can be done? We think it can. David Hansen being very ambitious about what artificial intelligence can achieve, but it's clear there's a huge wave of money going into it, not just from America, but also increasingly from China. Rory Kathleen Jones. Now to the Midwestern state of Ohio in the United States, where the police have come up with an unconventional idea to take drugs off the streets. They've put up billboards that invite drug dealers to report their competitors. Health authorities say 140 Americans die each day as a result of opioid abuse, and Ohio is not immune to the problem, as Alan Kasuja has been hearing from Marlena Harris-Taylor, a health reporter for WCPN Radio in Cleveland. Ohio is only second in the nation behind the state of West Virginia in overdose deaths. And drug overdoses are the leading cause of death in Ohio right now for people under the age of 55. Law enforcement officials use this number. They say 11 people a day die from overdoses in Ohio. Wow. It's definitely yeah. not surprising that the authorities are trying to do something about it. Tell us about this number they've introduced where drug dealers are being promised what? Bigger territory? <laughs> this is a really interesting billboard. It's in Mahoning County, which is east of Cleveland, close to the Pennsylvania border. The sheriff there basically is saying to the drug dealers, turn in your competitors. And in theory, if you turn in your competitors, that gives you bigger territory, right? Yeah. So I don't think he's promising he's going to give them bigger territory. I think he's just saying you're going to clear the field, if you will, if ah. you turn in your competitors. Okay, the way I understood it was, you know, get rid of your competitors and we'll give you a bigger <laughs> space to operate. Um, but you've got to wonder, though, about whether or not the authorities 
have the whole drug epidemic under their control. What else are they doing to contain the situation you described? They are pretty desperate in trying different things in Ohio. I mean, you have that sheriff who's putting up billboards, but in another part of the state, you have a sheriff who started a program that's focusing more on getting people into treatment. Cool. And in fact, people are saying that's a model for the entire state and many other law enforcement agencies are trying to do this now because they're saying that you just cannot arrest your way out of this problem. There's just too many people. And just going back to that hotline um, that was set up on the billboard, do you know if they've received any calls at all? Because I'm sure there are people in Ohio who are also desperate to do something about the epidemic. <laughs> well, as far as I know, they have not received any calls. And this is just one community where this billboard is. They have not flooded the state at this point. But I think it'll be an uphill battle for law enforcement to get drug dealers to call them and, <laughs> and to turn in their fellow criminals. Because as you could imagine, most people engaged in this kind of lifestyle have other warrants and they're afraid of getting in trouble themselves. Yeah. And there is sort of this cold among criminals, isn't there? Marlena Harris-Taylor, a health reporter for WCPN Radio in Cleveland. A Spanish man is recovering in hospital after waking up in a body bag in a prison morgue. Mr. Gonzalo Jimenez was just minutes away from actual death when doctors realised their mistake. With the details, here's Ellie Costello. It's the stuff of nightmares. Being buried alive or waking up in a coffin is a common human fear, as raised on this edition of the television show Family Feud. Top six answers on the board. Here we go. Name the first thing you do if you woke up in the city morgue. I will wonder, how did I get there? Wonder. <laughs> but it actually happened to a man in Asturias in Spain. Gonzalez Jimenez was found alive by doctors who began to hear snoring and wheezing coming from inside his body bag. He had complained of feeling ill the day before, so after he failed to show for morning count, the authorities informed his family that he had passed away in his cell, having been found purple and suffering from rigor mortis. Mr. Jimenez was then placed in a cool room. But when the body began moving and making noises, doctors were stunned to find the prisoner alive, according to the newspaper El Español. From his hospital bed, Mr. Jimenez explained how it had been assumed that he was dead. I was dead, sitting on a chair, and from 8 o'clock until 12, my heart had stopped beating. The family have revealed their outrage over the incident and have alleged that just one prison doctor actually examined Mr. Jimenez's body before the death certificate was signed. Three doctors are needed to confirm a prisoner dead. Mr. Jimenez was then rushed to Oviado Hospital, where he remains in intensive care. It's reported that he could be suffering from catalepsy, a condition which slows vital signs down, making it impossible to detect whether a person is alive. An investigation into the incident is ongoing. Ellie Costello, who I suspect is going to be responsible for nightmares all over the world in the hours to come. That's all from us for now, but an updated version of the Global News Podcast will be available for you to download later. If you want to comment on this podcast or the topics covered in it, you can send us an email. The address is globalpodcast at bbc.co.uk. I'm Alex Ritson. Until next time, goodbye.